I was thinking about what to do next with this, this counting circuit. And I think what I'm going to do is try to make more digits. So I think I'll have it so that when this counter reaches its maximum, it'll roll over and start counting on another chip so that I can have more than one decimal plate or more than one digit, right? Um, I would look through my parts in my, my TTL kit here that I use all the time, and I found a number of possibilities. So I, I have enough seven segment display drivers to do four digits if I hook it up this way. And I think I have enough resistors for that. So I would like to ideally try to come up with a way to make a four digit counter that just, you know, gets up to 999 and then rolls back over to zero, something like that. In order to do that, I would need four of the, the counters I have now, but I don't, I only have two of those. And the kit had two of an additional type and two more of yet another type. And they have, they have different pinouts. So I'm not really sure how to choose between them exactly, but uh, I don't know, might just have to try something and see if I can get it to work. Here are the three options that I think are maybe the best from the kit that I have. We have the 160N, which is what I used before, so I've already used one of these. And then I have the 162N, which I remember trying to choose between these two previously, and I just happened to pick this one. And I really need to figure out what the actual differences are between these. And then there's the 192N right here, which I haven't used that one at all. Okay, here's the data sheet for the 160N, which we're pretty familiar with because I've already used that in a circuit. So I, I, I roughly understand how this one works. I wish I had four of these because this would, this would be easy. I would just chain these together. And I'm pretty sure the way I would do that is I would just have the ripple carry out, chain into probably the clock on the next chip over and just kind of repeat this circuit that I have here for each digit. But since I don't have four of these, I'm going to have to try to adapt. Okay, so the next chip to look at is the 162N. Now I remember comparing these data sheets previously in a previous video and they seemed virtually identical. And a commenter pointed out, and sorry, I don't remember your name, but at least some, at least one person pointed out that they they're pretty sure the difference between the 160 and the 162 is that the 162 does everything on a clock pulse including the clear or the reset function and that if that's the case then that you know is a pretty minor difference i don't know how i would clear my display starting if that's the case i'd have to figure out a different reset circuit i guess but that might be okay Otherwise, the, the pin layout is actually identical. So the only thing that's different would be a, a slight maybe functionality difference. I don't know how much that would matter in practice. So yeah, I don't know. Okay, and the final one was the 192N, and I couldn't find an actual HLF data sheet for that one, oddly enough. So I found this Texas Instruments one, and I imagine, you know, comparable. The pinout is, is very different. This one also supports counting up or down. So this one doesn't actually have a like a single clock like the other ones do. It has, I guess, in a way, two clocks. One's an up clock, one's a down clock. But the, the question kind of remains here. I have only two of each type of counter chip, and I would really like to do four digits. So the circuit's going to have to adapt to that. Now, if that uh, one commenter was correct, and I think they might have been because I looked up the Texas Instruments sheet for this chip as well, this 162, and it does seem to behave differently. Like clear only happens on the clock pulse, for example. So I don't know if I should make the how clear works be the determining factor in all this, but I'm, I'm leaning towards trying to use these 192Ns, which are very different than this chip's pinout but I think I can probably adapt to that. So if, if I'm going to use this one, I'll put these away or over here. These are the drivers for the seven segment display, which I see has stopped working because I bumped a wire. These wires are very finicky. I think what I'll do is I'll make, I'll make two boards, right? I'll, I'll do this and I have another blank one. This is my last large blank board. And I will make a board that uses each of the two counter chips type, and I'll have two of each on it, right? So two displays, two counter chips, and I'll try to get each individual board to work by chaining together and then chain the boards together and then feed them all from, from the clock and have it, you know, ripple to a full, like four digit excessively large display here. So I think that's what I'll do. And probably I'll just sort of 
speed through the actual reconfiguration process here because I'm not sure there's a lot to talk about short of just hooking it up and seeing what happens. So this this may actually end up being a very short video because, you know, while it might take me a while to reconnect all this stuff, I'll just zoom through it in editing or something and then we'll see if I pull it off. Okay, if I'm very lucky, I have both chips driving both displays. I really hope nothing's messed up here. To do a quick test on this, I think I'll hook up that lamp test. If I remember right, that turned on all of the segments. Okay, but these are dim for some reason. Why are these dim? I'm not sure what would be causing that. I'm going to try tying the those those other signals to high to make sure nothing weird is happening first. But if they stay dim, I'm not actually sure what to do ab about that. Okay, I swapped out this display. When I was probing around before, when I had first hooked it up and I was checking to make sure the segments were hooked up, I realized on, on one of the probes, I, I was connecting VCC directly to, to the pin and it didn't go through the resistor. And I wonder if I actually managed to kill this while I was testing it. That seems quite plausible, to be honest. So I guess I'll just set this over to the side and not use it, because this, this is doing what I was hoping it would do. Lamp test is tied high, so it's forcing all the segments on, so at least, at least they're all hooked up. It doesn't mean that they're, in the, you know, that they're in the correct segments, I suppose. We'll find that out later, but at least they're all hooked up. So that's a good first step. Uh, I think the next thing I'm going to do is hook up the the counter, and at least one of the counters, and you know try to get things back to counting kind of like before, and then connect one counter to the other counter, and really hope that this works because that's kind of the whole point of this experiment is to see if they can if I can chain them. So we'll do that. The other thing on the chips that I have to deal with is that they have those inputs for like presetting it to a value. I think I'm just going to leave those disconnected and tie load to high so that it never tries to load. I don't think that should matter. I mean, who cares if it reads garbage? I'm never going to trigger load, so I don't I don't know that it matters, but we'll try that. Okay, I think except for the clock, I think I have everything hooked up. I was just going to test these one at a time, but since I've been connecting them up in in parallel, you know, doing doing connecting one pin on here and then one pin on here, I think the only pin I need to connect that's left on the counter chips is the clock. So maybe I'll just go for broke here and I'll connect the ripple from this one into the clock of the next one and set up the chain right here from the start and see what happens. Okay, so this this here is the ripple output of this. Well, okay, which digits? Would, this is the ones digit. So I would want to be pulsing this clock and having this one's ripple go to this clock. Yeah. So then in theory, I think all I need to do is ripple this clock and I might as well bring in the timer. I have that here. The clock should be this pin, pin two. I think that works. Okay, let's plug in the power. Okay, here we go. Moment of truth. Maybe, wait, no, no, I have to do something else. These two power rails are connected together, but this chip or this board no longer has power. So I need to, I need to bridge the power here. Here we go. Ha! First try. I think it's doing it. Nine. Then that one goes up. No, something's a little off. This is going up too soon, isn't it? That's going up. It hits nine and then that goes up. You want it to go up when it rolls back over to zero, like on the next pulse. So chaining them together here like this is not quite working. I need to think about this a bit. So the clock is pulsing onto the clock input here. I think it changes on the downward swing. The ripple is ripple. Ripple must not be, it must be turning on on nine. Oh, I can slow this down. Or speed it up, slow it down. Okay, six, seven, eight, nine. Right, see it, it, okay. It goes up when nine happens. The ripple out is probably false or low 
for all the other digits except for nine, right? So it's so the signal's low, and then nine happens, it goes up. There might be another way to hook these up. What if we just fed the clock into clock so that the chip is always pulsing with the clock, but we only en enable the P because that enables the counting. So on the first chip, we would tie clock and pin seven together. So it's always enabled on every pulse. But what if instead of feeding the ripple carry, the, the ripple, the output, the ripple carry from this chip into clock, we feed it into the enable and then we just have the clock tied to the same clock source. We want them to change at the same time. So the clocks probably have to be synchronized across all the chips, not chained in this way, perhaps. Uh, I don't know, pretty easy to, to hook it up and, and test it. Okay, what I did here is not, not quite what I said I was going to do, because when I went to do it, my brain suddenly shifted and might have had a slightly easier idea. So now it's basically what I said, but there's no reason to, to tie the clock and the enable pin together on this chip because I want the ones place to always count on every pulse. So I'm leaving the enable pin pulled high here all the time. But what I changed then is I, I bridged the clock from this chip over to here. So the clocks are synchronized now across these two chips. And then all I did was take the ripple carry output from this chip and move it into that enable P rather than into the clock on this chip. I think that's the same effect here. So let's see what happens then. Okay, I think that was correct, right? I missed it though, nine. Right, yes. Yeah, I think that's working. I mean, it didn't reset at zero, of course, because I, I haven't done anything about the garbage reset situation, but I think that's actually working. And then it should roll over to zero, zero. And it did. Oh, that's awesome. There we go. A two digit counter with a variable speed. That's cool. So what I want to do is, is add a second board, or at least what I intended to do was add a second board. I don't know how long this video is going to be in editing, but this connecting all this took a surprisingly long time. So I think I'm going to actually stop it here now. Okay, that was really fun to make this counter, and it, I, I just, I love this. I, I don't know, I, one thing that I always loved about programming, or w what first got me into programming when I was a kid was the idea that you could, you know, type in these commands, and then, like, a for loop and print hello world or something, and, or actually, I guess, at the time, it would have been more like hello world go to 10, and uh, I loved just how the machine could just keep, doing a thing over and over again. I don't know why, but that's that's really kind of the hook that got me into programming in the first place. And this is similar. You know, the, the magic of this timer, just doing something on a regular interval and now having this whole, you know, cascading of signals creating a counter is still quite fascinating to me. And yes, this is a very, very simplistic, simple thing, but it's fun to, to build it up from, you know, I don't know, first principles, I guess, well, these aren't maybe very first principles, but pretty low level here. You know, there's no programming. This is just hardware. It, it's essentially forcing electrons to fall creatively in a way that does something neat. You know, I don't know. I don't know how to explain that. It's just, it's just fun to, it, to set up like a contraption. Like, I guess what it is, is like, this is like a Rube Goldberg contraption. You know, there's all these crazy things happening to the currents and the voltages and the electrons under the hood. And it makes a thing happen that has meaning to us at this higher level. Anyway, that's really cool, I think. So if you liked the video, uh, thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't. And if you don't like it, then I guess, you know, do the opposite of those things. And that's all for now. And we'll see you next time. Bye. The switch no longer works very well. The, the other video where I pushed it really quickly to check the power on states of my counter, I think I actually broke the switch. I have, it doesn't always click. It doesn't always stay down. Yeah, whoops. I have to kind of wiggle it. There we go.